Okay. I think we are getting live here. Sweet. Okay, so this is the second time I've given this lecture today. It's kind of nice. Uh, what we're going to talk about are membranes and uh, transport. Let me make sure I've got one thing set here I need to do. It's asking me to do something here. I think we're good. Okay. Yeah. Having to reset those cameras. It's okay. All right. So at any rate, uh, we're going to talk about uh, membrane bilayers today or phospholipid bilayers. Uh, transport, and then also uh, some diffusion as well. Okay, so we know that uh, you have these phospholipid membrane bilayers, and they're made up of a phospholipid. Now, phospholipid, making up phospholipid bilayers, let's break that down. That seems to be, you know, a lot of words. You know, lipids are these hydrophobic molecules made up of mostly carbon and hydrogen. Now, a phospholipid is you take a, a glycerol, those are those three carbons across the top, and you add uh, two fatty acid uh, chains to them, right? All carbon and hydrogen for the most part, and a little bit of oxygen in there. And then you, you stick a phosphate on that third carbon, hence the name phospholipid. Now, phospholipids have the property of being amphipathic. Now, amphi, think like amphibian. And amphibians live in water, they live on land, they live in two places. So amphipathic is similar. It's got both hydrophilic regions and hydrophobic regions. So the phosphate group has got phosphorus and oxygen, and the, those uh, are either charged or at least partially charged, and they can form hydrogen bonds with water so that the uh, the phosphate group up there is totally hydrophilic. And then those side chains, or not side chains, but those fatty acid chains, they're completely hydrophobic. They're made up of uh, carbon and hydrogen. So all nonpolar covalent bonds, right? So they have no way of forming a hydrogen bond with water. So they're hydrophobic, they're water-fearing. And uh, that's actually incredibly important because when you go to form a membrane, the hydrophilic phosphate heads, they go on the outside and they're gonna interact with water either outside the cell, extracellular space, or with water on the cytoplasm side, which is intracellular, which means inside. And the, the fatty acids are going to turn into themselves like that away from the water and you get a membrane that will form spontaneously. So cells, they, they make the phospholipids, but the phospholipids will assemble into a phospholipid bilayer. And if, of course, it's a bilayer because you've got two layers of the phospholipids. Okay. Now, you'll also hear terms cellular membrane. So a phospholipid bilayer is a cellular membrane. And of course, cellular membranes are incredibly important. And the reason why is because cells are a system, right? They're a system out of equilibrium with their environment and systems have to have a boundary around them. So cell membranes form the boundary between a cell, which is alive, and the rest of the world that's, well, if it's adjacent to other cells, it's alive, but right, basically outside the world that's not living. Okay, so phospholipid bilayers are cellular membranes. And when we start discussing eukaryotic cells next week, we have these organelles, these tiny little membrane bound structures inside of cells. Okay. And those membrane bound structures are also made up of a phospholipid bilayer. You'll also hear, so they're, they're cellular membranes as well. And you may also hear the term plasma membrane. So all three of those terms, phospholipid bilayer, plasma membrane, and a, uh, <laughs> getting tired here, my third lecture today, phospholipid bilayer, plasma membrane, and uh, um, cellular membrane. Those are the three things. Okay. So when you see something like this, here's your phospholipid bilayer. You can see those phosphate heads there 
and uh, the little uh, tails are in yellow. That's the uh, that's the fatty acid tails. And of course, you see lots of uh, proteins embedded in the membrane. And of course, uh, you know your membranes are about 50% proteins, right? 50% protein. Uh, that means there's a lot of proteins embedded in these membranes that perform a lot of functions, including transport, whether it's facilitated diffusion and active transport, which we're gonna learn today is incredibly important for the cells to maintain homeostasis and react to its environment. Okay, one other thing about cell membranes. Because they have a hydrophobic interior, they of course have something called selective permeability. Only certain things are allowed to pass through the membrane and uh, we will talk more about that later. And of course, you guys remember on, uh, on Tuesday, uh, I went over and said, hey, you know, this is the Balrog of Morgoth facing down Gandalf the Grey on the bridge of Khazad-dûm, right? And uh, of course, I love to quote, you know, Gandalf saying, you cannot pass. You know, I'm the wielder, the secret fire, the flame of Anor, the dark fire will not avail you here, flame of Udun, go back to the shadows. And then he, of course, takes his staff and cracks the bridge at Khazad-dûm and yells, you shall not pass. And I was very happy to hear some students at the end of class discussing whether or not Gandalf actually says, you cannot pass or you shall not pass. He says both. Okay, there's my, my uh, detour there for a few minutes. I have fun with this. Um, but the point that I'm trying to make is that cells have selective permeability, or at least their membranes do, in terms of what can enter and exit the cell across the membrane. Gandalf, of course, is not letting the, that beast, the Balrog, pass. But, of course, he let the, the, the Fellowship of the Ring pass. So it's an example of, um, of course, selective permeability. Okay. Now, we talk a lot about phospholipid bilayers. And basically, you know, every single cell on this planet is surrounded by a phospholipid layer. I know, I said layer, not bilayer. There's some weird cells out there called the Archaeans. And the Archaeans, they have a different type of phospholipid they use. It's very similar, but they don't use fatty acids. They use these things called an isoprenoid. And an isoprenoid is made by sticking isoprenes together. And you can see the isoprene, which are these, you know, little four carbon compounds. There's a couple, you know, double covalent bonds in there. And uh, what happens is you get these little uh, carbon tails on your fatty, not your fatty acid, but on your isoprenoid tail or your hydrocarbon chain. So there's a couple differences here. Um, you know, you still have the glycerol, you still have the phosphate, those things haven't changed, but you're using these branch tail, tails made up of these isoprenoids and instead of having an ester bond like you would with the fatty acid, because that's made with a carboxyl group, you take a long hydrocarbon chain, stick a carboxyl group on there, and you've got a fatty acid. These, uh, the isoprenoids are made where you stick it to the hydroxyl end of the glycerol, and that forms an ether linkage. Now, there's a couple things of why this is incredibly important. Uh, these uh, ether linkages and these branch tails using these isoprenoids make this molecule very strong, very strong. So as a result, a lot of Archaeans are what we call an extremophile. File means loving, right? So they love extreme environments, including um, hot, hot, hot areas. It's amazing. There are Archaeans that can survive and pH so low, it's like battery acid. There are archaeans that can survive, you know, frozen in Antarctic rocks. There are, I know, frozen in rocks, rock eaters. There's archaeans that can survive in boiling water. And part of the reason why they're able to survive in such harsh environment is because of those isoprenoid tails with the ether linkage. Now that ether linkage, is important you know I discussed that uh, just a second ago and it's also different from the fatty acid tail that you see here 
you don't have the little tails coming off, right? You got an ester linkage. But this phospholipid with the fatty acids, this makes up the cell membranes of all bacteria and eukarya. And you'll notice uh, that the tails are on the left side. And then when you get to this one, uh, oh, that's an ester linkage right there. They had the unbranched tails. But on the, on the isoprenoid tails used in Archaeans, they're on the other side. And that's important. So if you remember, when life makes molecules, whether it's an amino acid, a sugar, or whatever, uh, they make what's, they have, they have chirality. We make all left-handed amino acids. We use all right-handed sugars. So the Archean, the difference between the glycerol and the, and the, um, in our in bacteria versus the glycerol in um, the bacteria, they're, they're different between archaea and bacteria, right? One is using the left-handed form, and the other one is using the right-handed form. So there's some key differences here, right? Archaeans, they're using the the left-handed form of the glycerol, ether linkages, isoprenoid tails, you, me, and bacteria. We have the unbranched fatty acid tails with an ester linkage and we're using the right-handed or the D form of the glycerol. Now, you're probably going, why is he talking about this so much? Well, it's interesting. Gotta take it back to the dawn of life, right? This structure is a geological structure. You may recognize it. It's called the Lost City of Atlantis, right? So in the Lost City of Atlantis, this is a hydrothermal vent. Hydrothermal vent. It means it's water and it's warm water moving up through it. So our world is really geologically active, right? I mean, we got a warm core and mantle. Water from the ocean will get down into those warmer regions. And uh, there's all kinds of chemistry down there with the rocks. But also send that water back up and it's rich in minerals. And some of that water is also alkaline. So when the water starts percolating up through the seafloor, it deposits these minerals forms these structures like the Lost City of Atlantis. And importantly, we think that alkaline vents like this one may have been the birthplace of life billions of years ago. All right. Now, we know that life almost certainly had a single origin, or at least all life today had a single origin because, as we've talked about, we use all the same 20 left-handed amino acids we use the same four nucleotides for DNA and RNA. Well, you know, DNA uses thymine, RNA uses uracil. That's not important here. Even more important is that the, the genetic code of life is identical for all organisms across the board, with some exceptions of, of some bacteria trying to evolve to avoid being hit by viruses. But that's not the point. We have all these similarities that we have due to our common ancestry of the Whoa, I just stepped on a splinter, sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm not wearing shoes, but yeah, I'm in my office. But at any rate, um, uh, you know, you, you've got these, uh, all these similarities that show that we had the same origin of life because like I said, DNA, RNA, genetic code, you make proteins and ribosomes. However, for life to leave the, you know, the confines of, um, of the of his metabolic chambers here, its birthplace, to leave the nursery of his birthplace, life had to get a membrane around it, okay? And based on the differences between the Archean membranes and the bacterial membranes, it is very likely that the origin of the membranes was separate, that life diverged right at the beginning into the Archean and the Bacterium. And those in fact are the two, two of the two, two of the three domains in life. The third one of course is the Archaeans. I mean, sorry, is the eukaryotes. You, me, plants, animals, fungus, we're all eukaryotes. Uh, the Archaeans and the bacteria are prokaryotes. Uh, they lack a cell nucleus. They don't have the endomembrane system that uh, the eukaryotes have. Eukaryotes, of course, larger, more complex cells. So that's a third domain of life. 
But of the prokaryotes, like I said, there are basically two domains of life in there. And those are the Archaeans and the bacteria. And they've been uh, diverging. You know, they diverged right at the dawn of life because they almost certainly acquired their membranes independently of each other. So, yeah, that's pretty wild. Okay. Now, both Archaeans and bacteria, these were the first cells on the planet. They were almost certainly there together. And one thing about the phospholipid bilayers or the phospholipid layers is that, as I said, they will spontaneously arrange into these layers because the hydrophilic heads will interact with water and the hydrophobic tails, unable to form hydrogen bonds, will move away from the water and they will spontaneously form these bilayers. And that's, like I said, that's energetically favorable, which is good. Uh, so cells don't have to spend really any work trying to like arrange how to make the membranes, but they do make the phospholipids and the proteins in there. So once again, we're looking at our phospholipid bilayer. Uh, one thing you should notice, lots of proteins in it. And I've already said that. And uh, a lot of proteins are used for signaling. Uh, I think in this picture right here and in this one, there are these things called G protein coupled receptors, which is something you will learn about with Dr. Adama after the break. But basically, um, there's lots of signals inside of our cells. Or actually, that's true. There's also lots of signals floating around in our body. And those signals are there to cause cells to respond, right? They elicit some response in a cell. But for a cell to respond to a signal, they have to be able to receive that signal. And so we have lots of signaling molecules on the surface of our cells to receive all those signals to get some response. So in this picture right here, you'll notice that there are a lot of proteins embedded in the membranes. And in fact, um, like half of the mass or the weight of a membrane is actually made up of all the proteins embedded in it. Now, earlier when I was going off on a tangent about Balrogs and wizards from the game, uh, game of Thrones, oof, terrible, from the Lord of the Rings, uh, the idea that I was talking about was selective permeability. And selective permeability just means that not everything can easily pass through a membrane. All right, only certain things can. So because the interior of a membrane is hydrophobic, that means the small hydrophobic molecules, oxygen, carbon dioxide, nitrogen, easily pass through the membrane, all right? So when you're exercising and your muscles are using oxygen, that oxygen will diffuse right through the membrane with no problem. As you're breaking down carbohydrates and releasing carbon dioxide, as you're exercising, that carbon dioxide will diffuse right through the membrane, no problem. Water can also diffuse through a membrane. I know, I know, water is a polar molecule, but it's small, right? It's a uh, oxygen, a couple hydrogens attached to it, so it can go through the membrane fairly easily, um, but not as easily as carbon dioxide or water. And then you get the larger hydrophilic molecules like glucose and sucrose. You notice it goes through much slower, about you know, much, much slower. And then by the time you get down to the electrolytes, calcium, potassium, sodium, okay. As you notice, they're down there like one times 10 to the minus 12, all right? That's the, uh, what is it, um, in centimeters a second, right? So I mean, basically that's a trillionth. That's it, a trillionth. That means that membranes are incredibly good barriers to electrolytes are sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium. Okay, so there it is, small polar molecules, easily diffuse across the membrane, uh, small uncharged polar molecules, they can go through as well, but once you have a charge on something, it doesn't like to go through at all. Okay, not all membranes are the same. Right, and you think about this, right? So membranes have selective permeability. 
They also, we've called them a plasma membrane. It means they're fluid. They're, they're like a soap bubble, right? And things are floating and moving around. And how fluid they are also determines their permeability. So if you have high fluidity, you become more permeable. If you have less fluidity, you become less permeable. So you can actually think about olive oil. Something might diffuse across olive oil much easier than, you know, solidified bacon grease, right? So here's why this is important. Um, imagine a fish living in the Rio Grande. And in the summertime, uh, it's hot. It's like 80 degrees in the water. Well, its membranes have more thermal energy. They're going to have more kinetic energy. They're going to be moving around more. They're going to be more fluid and they're going to be more permeable. In the winter time, I've actually in February had to bust through the ice to catch fish in the Rio Grande uh, for population monitoring and, um, you know, a lot less uh, kinetic energy. Those membranes will be moving around a lot less. Now, fish can't have their membrane solidify. If your membrane solidifies and becomes not fluid at all, you have no permeability. That means you can't get um, oxygen into your cells and carbon dioxide out very easily or at all. So based on environment, like what's your, you know, your climate, are you hot, are you cold, or where you live, like in hot or cold regions, animals and plants can actually change the structure of their membranes to maintain fluidity. And here's how they do it. If you, um, if you have short fatty acids, okay, first of all, that means less van der Waals forces. That helps increase fluidity. If you have the, if they're unsaturated, that means if they're unsaturated in the cis position, they're bent. That prevents them from stacking helps them maintain fluidity, also prevents those van der Waal forces from helping them stick together. So you can imagine that you're a fish and you're living in a, um, an environment that's cold. You're gonna have a lipid bilayer with short, unsaturated hydrocarbon tails. Okay, so the fish in the Rio Grande, that's what they're doing. Now, as it warms up, I know, it's really cold today. I mean, in fact, we're on a snow break and um, it's really cold, but by next week it'll be in the 60s and soon it will be May and June before we know it. And it will be warm again. And when it's warm, the water temperature rises, those short unsaturated hydrocarbon tails, as the temperature warms, it's going to become more and more fluid and they're gonna become more permeable and you don't want it so permeable that things are just rapidly moving through because, well, you can't regulate it very well. You can't regulate what goes in. And of course that makes maintaining homeostasis really hard. So as you get into a warmer environment, you're going to have uh, a lipid bilayer with longer saturated hydrocarbon tails. Not only does it increase the distance it has to go through, but the hydrocarbon tails being long and straight the van der Waals forces will add up and make them more sticky. And so in higher temperatures with more thermal or kinetic energy, you uh, have lower permeability of fluidity. So that's how animals and plants or life bacteria too, how they can um, either adapt to cold environments and warm environments or acclimate to changes in the seasons. Okay. And then in animals like you and I, we, we talked about cholesterol. And you see that little, that little top thing at the cholesterol, that little round ball, that's your hydroxyl group, right? It's hydrophilic. That's what's interacting with the phosphate heads at the top. And then those ring structures, they're almost all carbon and hydrogen, makes them hydrophobic. They're down there in the fatty acid tails and they're helping hold them in place, which is gonna reduce uh, permeability. So cholesterol is kind of like a, a buffer in our cells. So as you can guess, uh, temperature strongly influences membrane fluidity. Uh, and this is a glacier up in Alaska. There's fish swimming around down there, including salmon. And you have probably have heard that cold water fish are good for you. Yeah, right? Because they're full of unsaturated fats and that includes the omega-3s, 
which is an essential fat. Essential meaning you need it, but you can't make it, so you have to get it in your diet. So salmon um, is very good for us. Uh, they're cold water fish. They have these polyunsaturated fats to help keep them from freezing, basically. Okay? All right. So there it is. I'm just talking more about it. I've already gone through this. I apologize. I already uh, gave this lecture once today, but basically during COVID, uh, I made slides with lots of information on them so that you would have that information readily available. I haven't stripped all the words out, so I've already discussed you know, the difference between saturated fats and unsaturated fats. Okay, so hopefully by now you understand the structure of phospholipids and how changing the structure of them can affect things like uh, their fluidity and also understand the two origins of cellular membranes and uh, yeah, all right. Now, let's go on to our next uh, lecture here. Oh no, I forgot to have it up. Hang on, I can get this here. Oh, gotta go to the keyboard here. I thought I had it pulled up. Sorry about this. I Let's see here. Bone growth, we don't wanna talk about bone. We wanna do membranes and transport. Okay, and then good old F5 there and then here we go I'm gonna move this down so if anybody has a question in the top chat you can hit me up with a question okay all right yeah so like I said I got the top chat if you got any questions I'm not sure what that means but uh, if you have a question about the material just let me know or if you're having difficulty or can't understand me just let me know okay so let's talk about uh, how molecules move across membranes. This is really important here. Um, get a cursor over there. There we go. One of the principles that we need to understand uh, before we talk about transport is, of course, diffusion. And once again, my slides have lots of information on them. Sorry about that. But diffusion is the spontaneous movement of a substance from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. Okay, this is also called spontaneous because it occurs on its own. You don't have to add energy. I want to come back to that. You don't have to add energy. There's a misconception here. Now, we talked about this thing called a concentration gradient. I know there's lots of words, it's distracting, my fault. But Let's talk about this gradient here for a second. A gradient is a change in value of something over a distance. And you guys are very familiar with gradients. Let's say today you walk out of your house outside and you go from your house, which is probably in the 60s, to outside, which out here is in the 40s right now. You went through a thermal gradient because you walked a few meters or a few feet and your temperature dropped 20 degrees. That'd be a thermal gradient. Uh, if you like to go hiking and you're walking uphill, as you're walking uphill, you're going up an elevational gradient, okay? Or if you're walking downhill, you're going down an elevational gradient. So if you look at my picture right here, imagine that ball sitting at the top of a hill. That ball has potential energy based on its position, okay? When I let that ball go, it rolls down the hill on its own. That's a spontaneous reaction. I don't have to kick the ball to make it go downhill or throw it. It's just like, uh, you know, when you're going down a concentration gradient in solutes, you don't have to add energy, just like I don't have to add energy to release the ball and watch it roll down the hill. And then, as it's rolling down the hill, potential energy is transformed into kinetic energy. Okay, now let's look at concentration. I've got something that says 35 parts per thousand. Let me just make sure nobody hit me up with a question here. We've got uh, 35 parts per thousand to zero parts per thousand. Okay, uh, 35 parts per thousand, I, I didn't pull that number out of thin air, that is actually the salinity of seawater. And then of course, zero parts per thousand would be pure water. And if you're not familiar with parts per thousand, imagine this, 
you go to the ocean, you grab a thousand parts of water, right? And if you have a thousand parts of this water, imagine that 35 parts out of a thousand would be salt and 665 parts would be actual H2O molecules, hence 35 parts per thousand. So the thing about a concentration gradient, so if I have solutes at 35 parts, get them in there. If I have solutes at 35 parts per thousand, okay, then they're going to spontaneously move down their concentration gradient to regions where there's less solutes. And you can do work with that right up until it reaches equilibrium, which is pretty cool. And that's actually very important that, um, that cells actually harness solutes moving down their concentration gradients. And typically we're talking about electrolytes. So you're going, wait, they don't cross membranes. We're getting to there. It's the diffusion, the facilitated diffusion, but cells can actually harness the work of solutes moving down the concentration gradient. So there you go. That's actually a very, very, very important uh, thing that cells do is harness concentration gradients. And in fact, uh, I've often said, or not me, but people in general that study cell biology will tell you that death of a cell is a loss of all those gradients. Okay, now just some basic terminology here. You guys know this. Let's say I have a dye and I put it in the water and the dye uh, basically diffuses till it reaches equilibrium. At the, time, at the point of equilibrium, the dye is, oh, sorry, man, my dog brought in a stick and um, chewed on it and that's why I'm, I'm in my socks and I keep getting these splinters. <laughs> Yikes. Okay. So the dye here is going to diffuse till it reaches the entire cup equally in all equal places. That's purple. That's equilibrium. Can't do any work there. You have high entropy. That's where the world wants to go. Uh, the water is the solute. And of course, I mean, sorry, the dye is the solute and the water is a solvent. So if I, if I put salt and water, water is of course a solvent and salt would be the solute. Okay, so this is representing a system that is out of equilibrium, like a cell. Cells are out of equilibrium with their environment. And this concentration gradient, the fact that I've got more solutes on one side of that membrane than the other, represents potential energy, right? So cells actually work to maintain all kinds of gradients mainly these things called electrochemical gradients, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, but they work hard to maintain these electrochemical gradients across their membrane because they can use that to do work and maintain homeostasis. And of course, the universe wants to be in equilibrium and you do not want to be in equilibrium, you'd be dead. Uh, just some minerals and some salts and some carbon dioxide and water and a few ni some nitrogen. But Diffusion will go until it reaches equilibrium. Once you're at equilibrium, uh, you can no longer have energy available to do work. It's a high entropy system now. Okay. Now, here's the thing. This is an important point. Excuse me. Uh, my whole family is getting runny noses and so am I. Uh, okay. Here's a sticky point. Here's an important point that you need to make sure you understand. Diffusion requires energy. I know you've always heard like diffusion doesn't require energy. Think about it. It absolutely requires energy. Diffusion is the movement of a solute from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. Okay. Think about that. The movement from high to low. Wait, we're moving. That's kinetic energy. If you don't have kinetic energy in a system, then you have no diffusion because nothing's moving. That's why whenever you make, this is my jug of tea I've been drinking on today. It's a nice green tea. That's why one of the reasons why you heat up your tea, your water, then put your, your tea in there is that the hot water will help diffuse through fast, more quickly through the leaves and bring out all of the chemicals that are in those leaves that make it taste yummy and are good for us. Okay, so let me say that again. Diffusion requires energy. 
you must have kinetic energy so things can move around and reach equilibrium. However, the fusion does not require the cell or anything to input energy. Think about it this way. Ball's at the top of the hill. Let the ball go. You don't have to kick it down the hill. You don't have to roll it down the hill or throw it down the hill. It goes on its own. Okay? That's an important point. Got to have energy available, but the cell, whenever uh, diffusion is happening, you don't have to spend energy. So, for example, if you are actively exercising and you start breathing in more oxygen, uh, that oxygen is carried from your blood to your metabolically active cells, you know, I mean your muscles, your muscles are needing oxygen. Uh, the oxygen will diffuse right through the membrane into the, uh, into the cell where it's needed. The cell doesn't have to do any work to move the oxygen across the membrane. Same as, as it's producing carbon dioxide because you're exercising, you don't have to move the carbon dioxide out of the cell. It does it on its own. Okay. So that's the fusion. Remember, it does require energy, but you don't have to add energy. You don't have to do any work. Okay. Now, another special case of diffusion is osmosis. Okay. Now, in the book, in this chapter, uh, they say that water flows from uh, areas where there's more solutes. Wait, water flows from where there's fewer solutes to where there's more solutes. Okay, it's flowing from more sol or less solutes to more solutes. I always have a hard time remembering that because that's not really the best way to understand water movement, to understand osmosis. And in fact, this is a case where uh, the people that wrote this chapter didn't communicate with the people in the later chapters. Yeah, I know. Um, we need we need these later chapters, right? Because uh, whenever you get to the plant and form and function, the way we talk about uh, osmosis is in terms of water potential. Okay, so water will flow from areas of high potential to low potential. That makes you know that makes sense, right? We're flowing from low to high. <laughs> I get that messed up. We're flying. We're flowing from high potential to low, from high to low. Water flows downhill, right? Okay, how does this work? As you add solutes to water, let's say you add electrolytes or salt or sugar to water, those are charged. The electrolytes, of course, are charged, either positive or negative. You know, your negative ones are your anions like chloride ions. Your positive ones are your cations like sodium, potassium, calcium. Well, they're charged in water is a polar molecule. It's got a partial charge. So these ions will attract water molecules. And as they attract and they hold on to them, and they prevent the water from moving. Sugars do this too. So what happens is, as you add electrolytes, as you add things to water, you lower the water potential. You lower its potential energy relative to pure water. In pure water, it can move around the easiest, okay? So as you add more and more and more solutes, the water potential gets lower and lower and lower. The water has less potential energy to move around. Another way to think of this is, you know, imagine you, uh, imagine you, you have some salt and you put a little couple drops of water on the salt. Good luck getting that water back, right? And the reason why good luck getting that water back is because the salt is holding on to it. So tightly uh, so that water has like really low potential. Okay, so this is showing osmosis. Uh, the term osmosis comes from meaning to push because if I have a membrane that's impermeable to solutes but it's permeable to water, I put more solutes on one side, water is going to flow from where there's fewer solutes, higher water potential, to areas where there's lower water potential and more solutes, and the water column will actually go up for a bit. Then eventually, you know, um, gravity pushes down on it, right? So it can only go up so far. Okay, so that's water potential. Very, very, very important. And this, this uh, thing about osmosis 
is also very important because cells don't actively pump water in or out. And in fact, cells maintain, um, they maintain water balance by controlling the electrolytes, either moving electrolytes in or out. Okay. So here's some more terms we need to understand. Let's say you have a cell and, and it's in an isotonic solution. Iso means the same, right? So let's say I've got five parts per thousand salinity on the outside of my cell, 5,000 parts per, per thousand salinity on the inside. So it's the same, right? What that means is you're in an isotonic solution. There's water flow in and out of the cell, but there's no net movement of that water. It's, it's an equilibrium, right? Okay. The next one is a hypertonic solution. What that means, hyper means like above, tonicity. What we're doing here is imagine you've got your cell and you stick it in salt water, right? You stick it in salt water and what happens is uh, um, water goes from high potential to low potential because there's fewer solutes holding on to the water inside the cell. Water potential is higher in the cell than it is outside. So water diffuses out of the cell and the cell shrinks. Okay, that would be a hypertonic solution. Well, if you have hypertonic solution, then you have hypotonic solutions. Hypotonic solutions, this is where water potential is lower inside the cell. That means you've got more solutes inside the cell. So imagine you've got your cell and you, you put it in pure water. In this case, water will flow into the cell and it will it will uh, expand and it, it can actually rupture. Okay, now you might be wondering, are there any real world applications here? The answer is yes, sore throat. Uh, yeah, these are running around my family right now. Uh, when I was a kid, if I said, uh, I have a sore throat, my mom without fail would say, go gargle with some salt water, right? It's like a, uh, it's a fixed action response, right? There's a stimulus. Mom, I got a sore throat. Response, it must be carried to completion. Go gargle with salt water. That's actually something you learn in uh, behavioral ecology. So at any rate, I used to wonder, does this really work? Well, the answer is yes. So when you get bacteria on your throat back there, you know, that causes an inflammation because your body's trying to fight off this infection. So the area becomes inflamed. And because it's inflamed, it's, you know, affecting the nerves and it becomes sensitive. So what you do is you gargle with some salt water and it will pull the water out of your cells and reduce the inflammation and your, sore, your throat feels better. Okay. Now, now that we're good with that, Let's go on to membrane transport. I'm not gonna finish this today because uh, earlier we have diffusion. We just talked about that. We have facilitated diffusion. Hmm, we're facilitating diffusion. Must involve some ions there. And then we have active transport, which I won't get to today on the active transport. Okay, let's take a closer look. Why? Is this just so incredibly important? Why do I, you know, even go beyond what's in this particular chapter here? Transport is used for so many aspects of maintaining homeostasis or everything we do on a daily basis. Just straight up, um, cells don't actively move water. The way they do it is by controlling the electrolyte balance. Are you letting ions or electrolytes in? Are you letting them out? Are you pumping them in, pumping them out? And by doing that, as you just saw, by changing the amount of electrolytes in your cells relative to your environment, you can control water balance, okay? Interestingly, our muscles and nervous system is incredibly dependent on the movement of sodium, potassium, and calcium across membranes. And in fact, every single movement and nerve impulse going through my body is a function of 
facilitated diffusion and active transport. Without it, I have no idea how you could ever get these things to work so quickly. So, like I said, you know, with animals, our, our movement, you know, our, our muscle systems coordinated by our nervous system is completely dependent, not just on electrolytes, but the movement of those electrolytes across membranes. Your stomach, you got hydrochloric acid in there. How do you get it in there? Chloride ion channels and proton pumps. And uh, if any of you ever happen to take uh, Biology 304 with me, you know that I you'll, you'll find out that I love the proton pump. They're, they're pretty cool. And they're incredibly versatile. They just get repurposed for so many things, including stomach acid. Uh, glucose absorption. You know, glucose doesn't go through a membrane very easily. You need some help. Uh, water movement in plants. I know. I said that uh, you don't pump water, but to get water to move into a plant, especially in arid conditions, you might change your electrolytes inside your cells to lower water potential to get it to move in. And of course, plants are transporting stuff all throughout their their uh, <laughs> their body, I guess. And uh, that requires a lot of um, transport as well, especially in the sugar transport in plants. Okay. Let's start with diffusion. So as we talk about transport, there's simple diffusion, facilitated diffusion, active transport. Basically, we've seen this. Diffusion is the ability of a solute to just cross the membrane uh, on its own without any input of work. Oxygen, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, water, and other small molecules. Ions and charged particles do not easily cross the phospholipid bilayer. And of course, we talked about what affects the permeability of these layers. We'll, uh, if you, we'll, you, we can review this again on Tuesday if you want to, but I just talked about it. Okay. And of course, this is just showing simple diffusion across the membrane. Now, a few minutes ago, I said all of these things require the movement of electrolytes. And I just showed you once again that electrolytes don't cross membranes at least not very easily. I mean, it's like a, one out of a trillion for every centimeter, right? I mean, it's, it's just, it's a very small amount. And that does change based on, you know, temperature, permeability of the membrane and things like that. But the main point here is, when we start talking about ions or our electrolytes diffusing across our membranes, they need help. We're gonna have to facilitate their transport. And to do that, we need proteins and we need lots of proteins to do this. And of course, this is showing all of these different types of proteins. They call it the fluid mosaic model because imagine, you know, these proteins kind of floating around in this mosaic of uh, proteins and um, it's fluid because the membrane is, is fluid. And what a lot of these membrane proteins are, are ion channels or carrier proteins to help move things across the membrane. Okay, so for example, uh, sodium, chloride, potassium won't really cross the membrane. So what happens is our cells, they have, uh, uh, they need help moving these things around. And they also need to maintain these gradients as well. So there I've got the electrochemical gradient. That's because ions are charged particles. So if I'm in a cell and I'm pumping out more sodium ions than I'm pumping in chloride ions or potassium ions, I should say, you set up an electrical gradient. Wait, I know potassium, sodium, though both positively charged. They're both cations. However, if I have more sodium ions than potassium ions on one side of my membrane, which our cells do, you create an electrical gradient. The outside becomes more positively charged compared to the inside. That's an electrical gradient. That's a voltage just like your battery. On the flip side, or not on the flip side, but in addition to that, because I've got more sodium on one side than the other, that's a chemical gradient. Combine the electrical gradient with the chemical gradient, you have an electrochemical gradient. Okay, so how do we get these things to do it? A facilitated diffusion requires a protein. You can have a channel protein or a carrier protein. 
So for example, uh, an example of a channel protein would be an aquaporin. I know, I said water diffuses across a membrane, but it does so more slowly than oxygen or carbon dioxide. Okay, now, there are areas in your body, there are organs that process a lot of water, like your kidneys. So in your kidneys, you have aquaporins that allow water to move by very quickly. We also have ion channels, and we have specific ion channels for sodium, for chloride, we have and potassium and calcium. So each one of these electrolytes has an ion channel. And some of these channels are gated, which means you can open and close them. And I'll come back to that here in a minute. And then another uh, type of uh, membrane protein for facilitated diffusion that's very important, of course, is the proton, uh, or, sorry, the ATP synthesis. ATP synthase makes most of the ATP in the world, ATP, of course, the energy currency of life, the vast majority of ATP is made by an ATP synthase, both in bacteria, plants, and in uh, animals. And the way it works is the protons, they're out of equilibrium with their environment. They flow through the ATP synthase as they're flowing through it. That kinetic energy is used to make ATP. So incredibly important. And then we have our gated channels coming back to that. These ion channels, basically we can open and close them based on what's happening inside the cell. So one is a voltage gated ion channel. So as you change the voltage across the membrane, that can open or close the channel. Another one is a ligand gated channel. Ligand gated uh, can be outside the cell or inside the cell. And basically a ligand gated channel is relying on a signal to open and close that uh, channel. And then of course you can have um, stress activated channels as well. All right, now this is as far as I got in um, the previous class. So I'm gonna stop here and uh, I'll see you guys on Tuesday where we're gonna talk a lot more about active transport and we'll review any of the questions you might have about facilitated transport and diffusion. I think these are Fairly straightforward, but you know sometimes it takes us a couple times before we fully get it. But we will we will pick up here on Tuesday, and then we will move into cell biology. And I'll start, of course, with prokaryotes. All right. Well, you guys have a good weekend.